Good morning and welcome to Messiah Lutheran Church in Oakland, New Jersey. My name is Pastor Courtney Smith Westerland and I have the pleasure of serving here and of knowing Janet these last few years and getting to love Gil through the memories shared from her. You all should have received the bulletin when you came in. Everything you need is in your bulletin. I'll invite you to respond in the areas that are in bold print. If you are joining us online, that bulletin is available on our website, messiahoaklandnj.org. Please feel free to use that and follow along and join us for worship. I also invite you this morning to worship as you are comfortable. Stand where you feel called to stand, sit where you feel called to sit, laugh, cry, dance. This is your time to remember and give thanks for the lives of Janet and Gil. So please feel comfortable in this space, grieving and celebrating in whatever way that looks like for you. I invite you to please stand or join in a worship position. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, who comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others. We are gathered here today to worship to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, and to remember before God our siblings Janet and Gil, to give thanks for their lives, to commend them to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our siblings, Janet and Gil. We thank you for giving them to us to know and to love as a companion in our, our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until, by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading is from Romans. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The second reading is from the book of Revelations, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, see, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things and I will be their God and they will be my children. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to John. Glory 
Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. And I'm going to invite Pastor Karen from the Cedar Crest Village to give the first family remembrance. Hello, everyone. Thank you to all of you for being here. You can hear me okay? All right. Thank you for being here to remember Janet. Tina and Brian, Wayne and Bonnie. I'm so honored to be here today at your invitation to help celebrate your mother's life to honor her memory, and to bear witness to her resurrection. She was a very special resident of Cedar Crest Village in Pompton Plains, and a very special member of our Protestant congregation for many different reasons. But the one reason that is prominent in my mind is that she was so sweet, she was so humble, and she never complained, which is, a pastor's dream come true. <laughs> Unfortunately, I only met her in the latter part of her life, after most of her lengthy obituary had already been lived out. I missed the part of her life when she and Gilbert fell in love and made their first home on a swampy lot overlooking a shallow puddle of a lake. I missed out on the years when she was a bright student and a positive role model, when she worked at Hoffman LaRoche and Coldwell Banker, when she was a busy mom raising her children and volunteering, when she was knitting, baking, and ice skating, and when she was enjoying the golden years of retirement. What I didn't miss out on, however, is the faith that she nourished, she developed, and she demonstrated right here at Messiah Lutheran Church. I didn't miss out on it because her faith was written all over her face. She moved to Cedar Crest Village in 2017, but she continued to attend worship here every Sunday, which means that I didn't meet her until after the COVID-19 shutdown. In fact, I went back through my old emails and I found the first one I ever received from Tina. It was June 2020 when Tina contacted me to introduce herself and to ask me if I would give Janet a call. She told me that Janet had lost her husband of 59 years just two months earlier, that she wasn't able to get to her home church in Oakland due to the COVID shutdown, and that she had been watching the Cedar Crest Protestant worship service on TV every Sunday morning. Would you please give her a call, Tina asked me. Now I get emails and phone calls from family members all the time asking me to visit a resident. What struck me, however, about Tina's email is the language that she used. It was written in the language of our Christian faith. Our family has a solid faith in God and hope of heaven, she said, 
We believe that my dad is with Jesus in a beautiful place. Wow. How beautiful. How unusual to hear such words of grace and glory in an email, and how refreshing to come across as a Christian who sees the world through the lens of the resurrection. In one of my follow-up emails to Tina, I told her that I had just spoken with her mother. And then I said this, your mom mentioned to me that she has a hymnal and looks up the hymns every Sunday as she is watching the service on TV. Wow, imagine that. Imagine Janet alone in her apartment, sitting on the couch and watching the Sunday morning worship service on the TV because she couldn't get here to Messiah Lutheran Church. Imagine her opening up her hymnal to find the hymn and beginning to sing all by herself. Except she wasn't by herself, was she? She not only had the entire Cedar Crest congregation in her living room with her, she had all of Messiah Lutheran Church with her. She had her whole family with her. She had her late husband, Gil, with her, and she had all of the saints of God with her. That apartment was very crowded. <laughs> you know why? Because Janet had her faith. She was the one who raised her whole family to see the world through the lens of the resurrection. Over the past few years, the emails have continued to be sent between me and Janet's family. And they have always been filled with the language of faith. Phrases such as, we are trusting God who keeps us all in his loving hands. God bless you all with love, joy, hope, and strength. I ask God to surround Janet with his love and comfort. I pray for God's guidance and wisdom for our family. Lord, help us all. Your will be done, down here and in heaven. Amen. Those emails said more about who Janet was than anything I could ever say to you today, because they were a testimony to the kind of life she led and the kind of family she raised. You see, while you often express your appreciation for my ministry to your mom, what you don't know is how much I have appreciated your ministry to me. You have been the arms of Jesus, the voice of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the light of Jesus to me and to so many others. You have been humble, patient, kind, compassionate, generous, loving, and affirming. And even though I missed out on the early part of Janet's life when she was falling in love, raising a family, working hard, and helping others, I think I got to see the best part. Because the best part is the part she leaves behind. The legacy of faith that she nurtured and inspired, the family that took such good care of her when she wasn't able to do things for herself, and the loved ones who had the wisdom to let go of her when it was time for her to go and be with Gilbert again. That's why I wasn't surprised when Janet's family contacted me one day, not with the sad news that Janet had passed away, but with the good news, the joyous news that Janet had arrived in heaven. I don't know exactly what that first day in heaven was like for her, but I like to think that it could be described with the same words that you used to me in an email one day after you had worshiped with us at Cedar Crest Village. 
what a gift it is to worship in person. It was wonderful being in God's house this morning. Janet rejoiced as she took a look around. And then, can't you just see her sitting on the couch with her hymnal open in her lap, reunited with her dear beloved husband, Gil, once again, and surrounded by the saints of God. You told her, when the angels come, just run to Jesus. And she did. She did. Amen. I invite up Kathleen Karen to give the next of the remembrances. Good morning. I often think how wonderful it is to be able to be here and to have been able to become an ordained pastor. And as I listen to people talk about people that they love, I wonder how do you ever get through these messages? And I wonder the same thing this morning. That was a lovely message from her pastor, one of Janet's many pastors. So thank you for that. I am so grateful to be here today to share the stories and the messages and the remembrances of Gil and Janet and the community here that you have heard already so much about. So as I usually do, I sat at my desk yesterday thinking about this Sunday scriptures, but only it was different because I had sat there the day before and the day before that. Looking back at the broad brushstroke of my life and seeing the tremendous gift of being able to grow in a life of faith here. And I wondered, which is why I sat there so long, I wondered how could I even begin to talk about someone created by God to nurture and to love others into their gifts. But in that wondering, God spoke. I thought about Janet and Gil and the gifts that they gave me. Over these last few years, I've learned also to listen for God speaking as I prepared Sunday messages. And this past week, as I read the scriptures, I was not disappointed. God spoke through just a small piece of Psalm 139. And in that Psalm, the psalmist talks to God and says, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them had as yet existed. God helped me to look back and see the unfolding of my life here in the days that formed me. In the image of Gil and Janet's life and mine. I heard Gil's voice gathering and leading groups of folks to paint the entire outside of this building. <laughs> yep, and it took a long time and it wasn't always you know, that joyful. 
time. Because it was so important for him that this place be taken care of well. And we can see that now, more than 20 years later, this place is still here alive and full. I hear him regularly reminding us about Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. And in the last many years that I was here, more regularly than I can be now, Gil was a strong supporter as he affirmed my journey towards ordained ministry. Gil's words and our conversations became more and more treasured, though, as our conversations together grew more, grew shorter and shorter. I saw us picking, I remember picking blackberries and raspberries in your backyard, Tina. And today, thank you to Linda, I remembered ice skating from your backyard in those winter months. I remember, and this is crazy, but this is what I remember picking blackberries and raspberries in the bushes that line the side of your yard and saying to your mom, could we really eat them? Are they real? Are they going to be okay for me to eat? And she would just smile and say, of course, and then talk about all the things that you would make from those berries. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. You could pick berries in your own yard and eat them. There's a lot of memories like that. But there's also something else that has long stood out to me. I met Janet here when I was just a kid. I, I see Dawn is here somewhere. And when I saw her, it reminded me of those years. And when I came, I came as a teenager, a high school, a middle school teenager. So any of you who work with those or have those, you probably know how challenging they might be. I came as Kathy Kent, and she was Mrs. Godwin. I came by myself without my family. And I was a teenager whose idea of God was found in the prayer my brothers and I hastily would say before dinner. That was the only idea I had of who God was. I came with no idea, no concrete notion of God or why I would matter to such a great spirit. But one of the greatest gifts in these last couple of weeks, as I sat and I looked back and I have the privilege of being able to do that, I saw in that broad brushstroke of my life that there were God-shaped specks of paint. I didn't know it then, but thanks be to God that Gil and Janet and people like them did they not only knew it, but they saw them. And as I looked at, at the bulletin and I saw Janet's obituary, I didn't know when you had started to attend as a, a family had, had, when they had come here. But I was pretty much right on the money because I knew for sure my entire time in this congregation was overlapped by their presence and the family's presence. They had come here much before me, and I was grateful. I had been able to traverse that journey from a kid who related to adults into being an adult of my own. I moved from being Kathy Kent to Kathleen. Once I got out of college, Kathy no longer suited me. And then I moved to becoming Kathleen Karen. And Mr. and Mrs. Godwin became Gil and Janet. I never really thought much of that transition. But over the years, I've come to find, even in work with congregations whose members have been with them for a long time, 
the youth who've grown up sometimes never transition to that name change. It may seem like a minor thing, but I remember how hard that was for me. It felt weird. But as I look back now, Gil and Janet became friends and models of faith. People who truly welcomed me as an equal part of this deep and faithful community. And in the ensuing 25-ish years that we prayed and served together as adults, from providing a welcome for people who came through that door, over which hangs the sign that Janet championed, to conversations around our favorite fireplace, to coffee hours and church dinners, to Janet telling me about the paraments and the work of the women in this congregation who made them. That was a heart, um, that was so deeply important to her. And again, as I go to other congregations and I see paraments that are beautiful, that are purchased, I see and remember these paraments here at Messiah, so many of which were hand sewed. And I can still hear Janet's voice and her laugh, filled with faith. Good and gracious God, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. Janet and Gil, Welcome home from all of the days that God has formed you both. Welcome home to the place Christ has prepared for you. In Jesus' name. I think this wind is a message from Gil saying, take care of my church. <laughs> I'm going to invite Megan to give a remembrance, followed up by Brian. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, bear with me because I might not be able to see my notes because my eyes might be damp. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Going to visit our grandparents on the lake in New Jersey was always a treat. Didn't matter what the season or the reason, we knew we were going to have a ton of fun. We used to spend a week in the summer when we were little and would go down to the lake beach to swim, canoe and row across the lake, and play wiffle ball or croquet in the backyard. My brothers and I would sometimes spend the week together or take turns with different weeks, and it was always special. Of course, we had ice cream every night. We learned early on that you're never too full for ice cream because it just slips right through the cracks, no matter what you ate for dinner before or how stuffed you were. Grandpa is the man behind all of our obsession with mint chocolate chip ice cream, while Grandma would always have baked treats on hand, whether it be Lebkuchen and Snickerdoodles at Christmas time or her famous apple pie at Thanksgiving, we knew there would always be goodies at Grandma's. My Grandma and Grandpa really loved one another, and you could feel it all around you whenever you were with them. Jesus was at the center of their marriage and their lives. Now I really can't see. I'm so happy to know that they are reunited now. Gonna get the t-shirt. For those of you Friends fans out there, Rachel always cries and I am Rachel in my family. Okay. 
I am so happy to know that they are reunited now because I know just how hard it was on grandma when grandpa passed away during the pandemic. <clears throat> Before Grandpa started to lose more of his memory, he began writing down some of his fondest memories and typing up a journal because he didn't want to forget his life's most precious moments. He had said to me, when I can't remember this stuff anymore, I want to be able to read about it and know how incredible my life has been. He's inspired me to start now with my journaling. I will get through this, I will. <clears throat> He's inspired me to start journaling about some of my favorite days, so I have those feelings written down for later too. Both of them were also serious competitors when it came to any card game or really anything that you could compete. We would play spoons, I doubt it. There's another name for that game, which is not acceptable in church. <laughs> Uh, spades and apples to apples pretty much every visit. I think Grandpa probably won 98% of the time, which really had us grandkids in awe. We just didn't know how he did it. He would keep such a poker face, but would give a sly grin to one of us when no one else was looking. So we never actually knew what he was up to until he just happened to beat us all at whatever we were playing. We would literally laugh until we had tears in our, in our eyes and our cheeks hurt from laughing so hard. Grandma was an avid Jersey Shore seashell collector, and we always will remember our long walks on the beach together. Their daily walks were part of their lives all the way up until the end, and they were always on the move. Uh, we were actually joking last night at dinner uh, that Grandma maybe sat for a full five minutes at every meal. <laughs> because she was always so worried about everyone at the table being taken care of. Hospitality was practically her middle name. David, Peter, and I are forever grateful to have had two of the best grandparents anyone could ask for growing up. The list of blessings is really too long to count. We love you and will always cherish you and all of the wonderful times that we've shared together. And until we meet again, I hope you have as much ice cream up in heaven as your hearts desire, but please save some for us for when we get there. You guys are rough. Man, oh man. Pastor Karen promised she, me she was gonna make me cry. She was correct, it wasn't nice. Uh, and I'm a procrastinator. Sorry. So I'm I'm doing this silly thing here. I'm very sorry. Uh, you guys are all, man. Such a tough uh, group to follow, all of you. So I just want to say welcome, all of you, on behalf of Tina and Wayne, Bonnie and I. Uh, we just want to sincerely thank you all for coming today. Uh, we and we hope that many of you will be able to join us for lunch after the service share some more stories So I know we won't be able to hear them all uh, we're hoping I, our lovely uh, readers um, gave you cards uh, if you got an index card to write something down maybe a story of uh, kindness or how you'll remember them or how you saw Jesus through them anything will be a blessing to us and I have to tell you as as Kathleen alluded to um, this has been one of the hardest tasks I've had in my entire life. How to summarize 87 years for dad, 85 years for mom, 60 years together. So would you um, pray with me for a moment? Dear Lord, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for parting the clouds, being with all these folks through the storms, being with all of us through the storms, getting us here safely, Lord. Be with those who are in storms and flooding, today. And Lord, as we gather to thank you, as we remember your servants, Janet and Gilbert, please help us to honor them well, but point everyone to you, less of me and more of you and all that I say and do from this day forward. Forgive me my sins, for there are many. They will see and hear you and you only. And may the words of my mouth 
the meditations of my heart, of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my goal is not to tell you as many cute stories as possible in five minutes. You, um, you all have some, I'm sure. Um, from dad pitching on the, our church softball team with Tony and Ron and friends, or getting to count the offering with him maybe after church and searching for that last missing 50 cents for half an hour when he just wanted to go home. Thank you, Ron. They were, you know, they were both diligent, faithful workers. But I want you to know that their lives were not always a bowl, bowl full of ice cream with a cherry on top. I want you to know our family secret for making lemonade when life gives you lemons. The reason for the hope within Gilbert and Janet. So here goes, hold on tight. I don't have a lot of time and I am from Jersey, so I'm gonna to have to talk fast. Okay, so Gilbert was born in 1933. I'll give you a little family history. His mom, Martha Hagstedt, was born in Sweden in 1892. And you heard that right, over 130 years ago. She actually worshiped here with us from about 75 to 80. And if you do the math, she was over 40 years old when dad was born. His siblings were Raymond, age eight, Doris, 13, and Marion, 17. Marion didn't want to be seen with a baby brother for fear that people might think it was hers, her baby. And Doris, well, she got a real life baby doll. And since their mother, Martha, had postpartum depression, she changed lots of baby brother diapers. We know that dads didn't do them back then. I can only imagine some of his mom's thoughts. Perhaps, I am too old for this, or I thought we were done with diapers five years ago. But God had other plans. Surprise, our dad turned into a good surprise, or none of us would be here celebrating today. On Janet's side, she was the oldest of three, born in 1938 at home in Montclair. Because of the Lindbergh baby stealing scare at hospitals, her mom had a midwife and not a doctor. Her parents both came from Germany after World War I and met in New Jersey at night school, learning English. Both families lived through the Great Depression that started in 1929. And even Tina and I were raised with that mindset of waste not, want not. Turn off the lights, get off the phone, turn down the water. But we were obedient. I hear laughter over here. He understands. <laughs> but we were obedient and complied, so it became a part of us too. So apologies to our spouses, Bonnie and Wayne, and our children, sorry, um, that got passed along. Um, and it's true, there are kids starving in Africa still today, but we did not dare say, could you send them my Brussels sprouts? <laughs> you just didn't do that, so we cleaned our plates. And we survived it. And now I even like Brussels sprouts. So change is possible. Now, Janet's mother, Helen, she knew heartache and hard work. Born in 1910, she lost her father in World War I. Her mom, we called Nunny, worked nights in a German factory to feed her four kids. And following her older sister, Helen got on a boat and came to America at age 17 in 1927. Worked as a, as a nanny, as a mother's helper for a very kind Reynolds family who our mom would then work for also in her teen years. And during World War II, Helen also lost a brother Otto in the war. We also learned that Grandpa Frank Mueller had depression, maybe bipolar, but that wasn't understood at that time. Mom told us he would sit in the dark sometimes, and I remember him being quiet, reserved, thinking, worrying, much like our Uncle Martin later, years later. But even at a young age, Janet would try to cheer up her dad. One Sunday, after church, this is a classic Janet story. She was maybe five years old and dad didn't go to church, but was fretting over paperwork, bills maybe. And she took off this little headband that she had with flowers on it, gave her dad a big hug and just slipped it on his head quietly. He was preoccupied, he had no clue. So a little while later, he walks into the house and grandma says, where have you been? And he says, oh, I just walked down to the corner store, but they were closed. Anyway, not realizing that he still had Janet's flowers on his head. That must have gotten some curious looks. But anyway, as you have, may have read, mom and dad met at St. John's in Bloomfield, very young. Both their moms brought them by bus every Sunday. And we're told that Gil was the only altar boy for quite a while. So Janet's mom certainly knew him and his mother, Martha. And Janet was a responsible big sister. We heard stories of her taking Martin to church on the bus, 
um, if maybe mom wasn't feeling good, or perhaps when their kid sister Linda came along when Janet was eight. You don't just skip church, you know. What a different world back then. And Gil was a leader in high school and was elected president of their Walther League, as the youth group was called back then. But when dad was a senior in high school, Janet would have only been in eighth grade since she was five years younger. And since girls mature faster and she hit five nine by thir age 13, I'm sure she stood out in the crowd in middle school. Looking at her yearbook, she was fairly popular, it seems. Reminds me of her granddaughter, Megan. It's funny that even in her 70s, on most of her trips to the store, uh, some little older lady would often ask her, can you reach something off the top shelf? And, <laughs> and like Jesus, I don't think she ever said no or looked the other way. It's little things like that that define our parents. And um, hmm. we've heard that on many of their early dates, um, Aunt Linda tagged along, or maybe was sent along as our grandmother's eyes and ears, a little tiny chaperone. It was probably good training, uh, parenting skills. So, but Gilbert waited patiently, went to college, served time in the army. He'd actually come home by train in his uniform to get the free ride, but he never wore it to church. In fact, he visited so often that folks there, like Alan Greiner, who of course knew he's here with us today, um, lots of folks didn't even know that he was in the service. And we rarely heard any army stories. We only knew he went to Fort Dix and then the DC area. Um, Dad served during the Korean War, but um, being that he had an engineering degree, he got to stay in the US and teach electronics courses. And his friend Alan, who's here with us, um, who knew both our parents, mom since I hear age three or four, um, could tell us lots of stories later, and including, including maybe his famous M&M story of how to stay awake in night school that I think even Pastor Courtney may try during uh, late night meetings. Anyway, in September 1960, they were married, Janet 22, Gilbert 27, and God was with them. They found one of the last open but swampy lots on Crystal Lake right here in Oakland, I guess around 61. But by May of 63, that swamp issue had been solved, a house was built, and God blessed them with Christina, my big sister, Tina, such a blessing, whom dad and mom loved the longest. And I showed up soon after, around, and um, around 1974, our friends, the Brummers, Donna's here with us today, invited us to come to check out this church here in Oakland. And we got to see the Shell family here in, this, in the old sanctuary, just down the hall, uh, starring the youth group's presentation of Prodigal Son, starring Al as the father and Alan and Larry as the sons. It was amazing. And that, I'm sure our family was then hooked and stuck around here for almost 50 years. Us kids loved the youth group, and our parents had a great time with the other parents, and I see lots of faces still with us today, Ludkeys, Axtells, and their kids who are with us here too. But I wanna tell you, there were some heartaches too. In 1984, mom's only sister, Linda, and husband, John, took this opportunity to work in Bermuda and were gone for five years. And also in 84, they became empty nesters, which actually may be a good thing, but I'm sure uh, was a little sad. But I'm also sure they never complained. You see, the joy of the Lord is our strength. In the summer of 86, real tragedy struck our family, and we'll never know if it was PTSD or depression, but mom's beloved brother, Martin, took his own life at about age 40, breaking our hearts, but especially his wife and our cousins, and I'll never forget dad's eulogy in that packed Catholic church, reminding us that we have a loving God who doesn't turn his back, even in our darkest hours. I love the verses that David read earlier from Romans 8. Nothing can ever separate us from God's love. So some joys in mom and dad's lives came along. They're sitting right here in 19, um, in, in Megan, David, and Peter, who showed up um, between 92 and 96. And they loved having them come visit for a whole week of school vacation, as Megan explained. And I would say to mom, are you sure you want all three at the same time? Don't they fight sometimes? And she'd say, not for us. There is never a problem. Send them all. And mom was thrilled to be at Peter and Haley's wedding a couple of years ago and add another granddaughter in Sweet Haley. And miraculously at age 82, another daughter in Bubbly Bonnie who was crazy enough to marry her boy 
in a snowstorm in 2020. You know, Jesus promised in John 16, 33, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And sometimes friends give up on each other, but moms never give up on their kids, at least ours never did, and our Heavenly Father never does either. Did you know that nothing you can do, there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less or any more? In 1 John, he writes, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our mom and dad had deep faith and the Lord got them through all those darker days and in stormy weather. And they had good health a long time, well into their 70s. And I recall mom asking Pastor Julie, why is it some folks have so many trials with health and others don't? And I don't recall Julie's answer exactly, but I think it was something along the lines of, it's a mystery. But praise God, some are able to serve him well and longer, and that they did. But troubles would come, and maybe, maybe soon after that chat. Around 2015, Mom started to prep for this big move from Oakland, from Lakeshore Drive um, to Cedar Crest. By age 77, Dad's memory was failing, getting worse. And in the springtime, he couldn't get the lawnmower started anymore. But in typical mom fashion, Vroom, she got the mower going and told dad, just take it for a walk around the yard. I can only imagine how that went. <laughs> Patience is not always her strong suit. I hear some laughter, some of you know. Okay, um, it's written in Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And I need to let you in on a secret. Our dad was very, very patient, probably because he had practice, waiting to, a while to marry Janet, waiting through college, the army. His cousin Buddy said that he had to hope that Janet would marry him before he lost any more hair. <laughs> but mom was, well, not always that patient. And I can hear Ellen Greiner laughing quietly right now. In fact, if we misbehaved, she was not about to wait until your father gets home. That would be unfair to him to have to spank the kids, okay, me, when he got home from work. And believe me, mom could handle discipline swiftly and effectively. In fact, it was, it was probably closer to teen years that she might have broken a wooden spoon on my posterior, <laughs> thus proving that I was also a bit of a hard, oh, sorry. But I think we all soften over time. Mom did, and pretty sure I have too. Anyway, mom worked hard. She decluttered, downsized, gave lots of stuff away to thrift shops, etc. By January 2017, roughly 55 years after moving in, they say goodbye to Lakeshore Drive. But it was a much needed hello to Cedar Crest. And God was with them once again, giving them great friends and neighbors there. Mom was still a good driver and would continue getting them to church in Oakland. As Pastor Karen pointed out, church just becomes family. You know, what a blessing. Our dad was such a great example of a godly man, husband, father, grandpa, not perfect, but a truly gentle man. And we got to see him, Tina and I, um, reading this book that's a bestseller around the world every year, but doesn't make the New York Times list. I guess it's too boring, but it's not. It's the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. And just like our Heavenly Father, he did not knock our doors down, didn't tell us, you need to read this, but I, I kind of wish he did. I didn't fully discover this until I hit bottom in 2016. You see, sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. And on the surface, folks at church might have thought that maybe I was a good dad and husband like my dad, but my family knew our dad is hard sometimes, too often. And I wish I listened to my mom who knew and would see it and would tell me, get more rest, count to 10. My fuse was way too short, not always patient and kind, but too arrogant and proud. So I'm gonna to have to give you some verses that dad would want you to know. Beginning with 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I guess this means even the Old Testament is important. So here's one, listen carefully, it has the key to success at the end from Joshua chapter one. The Lord said to Joshua, Moses is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them, the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. 
no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as is I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to give to their ancestors. And be careful to obey all the law that Moses gave you, that you may be successful wherever you go. So keep this book of the law always on your lips and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. That is exactly what our dad did. And I'm not saying our folks were perfect, they weren't. They certainly lost patience with each other, just as any married couple does after a year or so. But here's some other verses they would point us to. First Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. It isn't arrogant, boastful, or proud. It doesn't demand its own way, like I used to always do. It is not easily angered, doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and endures all trials. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, if you don't know it already, you haven't heard, I want you to know that God is love, pure love. In 2 Peter, he writes, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He wants you to have eternal life with all the saints before us, including Gilbert and Janet, and he still answers our prayers today. I know this is long. I am just going to give you one or two, little example for mom and for dad. When dad was struggling with COVID in April 2020, no one could visit him, not even our mom, which was gut-wrenching, heartbreaking. You can only imagine. I did a funny thing. I asked all 700-something of my closest Facebook friends, which is ridiculous, I know, if any of them pray, please pray for our dad, that God send him an angel to be with him, to guide him in his last days on earth. And I was on the phone telling mom about this request, and my neighbor's little white cat, who's named Angel, comes right up to my front door. This is not a common name for a cat. This is a little unusual, but he comes, she comes right up. You can't make this up. And I start laughing. I do not believe in coincidences, but that God is in control of everything. In fact, Albert Einstein once said, coincidences occur when God wants to remain anonymous. So I laughed with joy that if God can send an angel cat to my doorstep, he is able to do much more than we can ever imagine or ask to take care of our dad. So I told mom, hang on, I need to go outside and get a picture of me with Angel to let our, or my Facebook friends know. Our message has been received as if there was ever a doubt. Okay, one last story for mom. Mom had a stroke a couple years ago, affected vision and memory. She couldn't drive anymore. She couldn't knit, which gave her such purpose and joy uh, along with her buddy Carol, right? And helping others. She'd often say, I want to go to heaven. We just didn't think she was that ready or that strong to stick around three months without eating more than part of a strawberry or maybe a half spoonful of applesauce. So she was put on hospice care after about a couple of weeks due to weight loss. And, um, you know, I don't really know what that means, right? Um, put on hospice. So I researched how long do people tend to live without, how long do people tend to live without eating? And it says, well, roughly, um, you know, it depends on the person's size, health, factors, but eh, roughly three weeks. So as we get close to three weeks, I get scary. I want to be there when she goes, right? You know, and spend as much time with her as possible. Love her as long and as best as we can. But three weeks grew to a month, two months, and wow, she might make Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh, she's, she may make Christmas. But we got to celebrate Emmanuel. God come down for us and with us, with mom, one more time. We prayed for angels to be there with mom when we couldn't, and he answered again. On Christmas Eve, the overnight aide who was assigned that night was a lovely young Christian lady from Guyana named Shaloma. She has peace in her name. How cool is that? She was only there because her regular client was away on vacation. God is so good. Not only did mom have Christmas peace, but so did her family, so did all of us. And so Shalom was with mom on 1224, 1225, and we were overjoyed when she was back again the next week and as mom made it to New Year's Eve. And Tina, Wayne, Bonnie, and I 
got to kiss her and hold her hand and sing songs one more time with mom and read today's scriptures promises to her amazing grace how sweet the sound that then brought our mom home to the lord in the morning of january 1st well done faithful servant enter into the joy of the lord she wasn't opening her eyes much in that last week but she would hold our hand even though we tell her there is nothing here on earth worth her holding on to when someone comes to bring you to the big party with jesus just grab their hand and run so learn from them my friends invite jesus into your heart have this peace that we know that our redeemer lives he alone has conquered sin and the grave so that we can be with him forever and ever You have heard so much today about the amazing Gil and Janet. You've heard about the readings, and so I am just going to skip to the end. Here at our church, we talk a lot about God moments as a way and a place that we see God in our lives. And this week, while I was setting up the beautiful table display with Tina, we pulled out Janet's Bible. And I was nosy, and so I was flipping through the pages, and I found a bookmark. And so I want to give you one final reading today from Janet herself. Psalm 71. My life has been an example to many, because you have been my strong defender. All day long I praise you and proclaim your glory. You have taught me ever since I was young, and I still tell of your wonderful acts. Now that I am old and my hair is gray, do not abandon me, O God. Be with me while I proclaim your power and might to generations after generation. Janet and Gil proclaimed their belief through their love and their action from generation to generation. And now they have claimed their place in God's everlasting kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servants. We will end on a little bit of a joyous note, singing our next song, which is Janet's favorite. So take us away, Bob.
invite you to join me in affirming your faith in the triune God that Janet and Gil loved so dearly using the words of the Apostles Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. I will end each petition saying, God of mercy, and you are invited to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God and holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to the sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and a sure and certain hope in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for a musical offering from Tracy and Bob Bassey. I just want to say this is a gift from our brother Wayne, who went to this thing called Tres Dias. And then Tina went, Dad went, Janet went, and eventually I went and got to meet uh, more family. Uh, so this is Bob, our beloved Bob and Tracy. <laughs> Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on.
If you stand before the power of hell, then death is at your side. Know that I am with you. We will share the peace at the end of the service. And so I invite you to join me as we say the Lord's Prayer, gathered into one by the power of the Holy Spirit, praying in whatever language or translation is most familiar, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This prayer of remembrance is something that I found in a bulletin once here at Messiah and we've continued to do. A few years ago, we had a memorial tree planting where we honored Gil and said this poem. We will say it again today. We remember both of them. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. They have shared their lives with us. They are a part of us and we remember them. At this time, I invite any rostered minister to come and join me for the commendation. Let us commend Janet and Gil to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servants, Janet and Gil. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, sheep of your own fold, lambs of your own flock, sinners of your own redeeming. Receive them into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Thank you. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen.
<laughs> it does sound good, man. It's, it's 